Yes, uh, thank you very much for coming here and uh, attending this uh, lessons. Also for testing our contents because this is may be a bit basic for many of you already but it's just the introduction to show what packaging really is and uh, a little bit of also uh, some historical view on it as well. So um, let's look. Yes. So just the, the outline. Oh, there's still unit 1.1 in it. We have to change it because this is from the old. Yeah, OK. Uh, anyhow, um, I will give you a very brief historical overview on, on packaging. Um, talk about the significance. What is packaging in relation to food? Um, some terminology also because I learned from, from my experience that uh, the good use of terminology oh. is always very helpful, especially when you are, we are dealing with uh, legal issues and you will find in, in several um, directives and other legal frameworks that the terminology is not used correctly, which gives a lot of confusion. Uh, packaging functions, what is the function of packaging? It does not only to have to protect, and some final conclusions in the end. All right, so this is, uh, let's say, briefly the history of packaging. Uh, I have, uh, let's say, four timelines. Uh, one is the timeline for the materials, the packaging materials. One is the timeline for packaging manufacturing. One is the packaging technology itself, preservation and packaging. And the, the, the last one is the, the retail, the development of uh, in retail. I won't tell you any, everything on, on this slide because this would prolong my presentation a bit too much. But um, just to tell you that packaging already started 10,000 years ago when the first people um, be, began to um, create ceramic pots to store food. And uh, this was refined over the years and over the uh, centuries uh, with the basic packaging materials, glass and paper, already known by the Egyptians. Uh, then there was a long break until they developed tin plates in uh, around 1800. Uh, cellulose film, which was the first uh, packaging film available uh, around 1913. Uh, today it's being sold again as some, let's say, uh, sustainable alternative which is especially confusing if it's coated with PVDC as a, a, a <coughs> synthetic polymer. But nevertheless, today we have a lot of plastics. That's uh, in, in terms of numbers, the main uh, number of material. Um, we had a, a similar development in the uh, manufacturing side. <clears throat> the first mechanized paper mill came up in 1803 before it was necessary to, uh, to make the paper by manual operations. So this mechanized paper mill was still partly manual, but it already had a lot of mechanization in it. And this was uh, pursued more and more. And today we have a lot of processes there, which are driven automatically. The same for packaging the packaged goods. They knew for a long term time to how to conserve food. Very traditional, but still used in today: salting, cooling, drying. But then there was the famous. Uh, heat sterilization from Nicolas Appert, who invented the, this 
process. It was used then for glass and metal packagings. We had first packaging machines, and today we have techniques like aseptic modifi and modified atmosphere packaging, which form, let's say, the top level of packaging as such. But also for all these things to develop, we also had to achieve a development uh, in the supermarket side or in the uh, market side. Uh, it's long ago that the first prepacked goods were already sold in the US. And also the first self-service shops have been created in the US, whereas this only happened in Europe after World War II. All right, so, so much for the brief overview. And um, there's also something that comes in addition to this, and this is the targets for package. So when you look at this timeline once again, um, the main target was to keep the food consumable for a longer time. So for instance, the, the latest development there was active and intelligent packaging. So there was the development from keeping the food just consumable to keep it as high as possible in quality and as long as possible in shelf life. But today we also started in reducing environmental impacts only in the, in the 1970s. And today we are talking about extended producer responsibility and circular economy. So we also have had to notice that these targets have been changed over the years. And what was good packaging uh, 30 years ago must not necessarily be a good packaging today. All right, so um, you saw that this development in the different um, areas was necessary to come up with today's features of packaging, but um, it seems to be, uh, let's say, a dramatic timeline, but look to other technologies, packaging technology is relatively slow. It needs to uh, go into many different areas, and this needs time. So if you would like as a packaging professional to be informed and to have an, a view of that, what happens in the future, it's very good to know about these facts. And my personal opinion is there will not be, let's say, some uh, drastic innovation, as many people hope and expect. But to my opinion, it's more or less a systematic and, uh, yes, let's say slow type of innovation that happens over the decades. Good. So the next step, uh, the significance of packaging for the different goods. We have basically two chains, the food chain and the packaging chain, which joins at the point when food and uh, is packaged in a packaging type. And uh, this is changed over the years due to uh, the ex uh, extended producer responsibility and uh, circular economy. The packaging chain is no more a chain, but it should be a circle. And this circle is just in a very fast type of development. Whereas the chain, okay, to imagine a food circle is a bit difficult, I would say. So they come together. Most of the time, packaged food is stored in retail and at the consumer. And um, we need to look at those two different chains to understand what is going on. So 
the next thing is which kind of packagings are we talking about? We are talking about consumer packaging or sales packaging. Um, there's not food, what's the main issue of fitness, but we also have non-food packaging. Uh, this is the next step of uh, this network, pharmaceutical packaging, cosmetics, cosmetics packaging. And interestingly, all these things have different frameworks, for instance. So food packaging, for instance, is regulated in the EU by one type of directives. Pharmaceutical packaging is regulated in a different way and with very strong action of the industry. And cosmetics packaging, this is a little bit uh, difficult at the moment. What we also have is industrial packaging, business to business, which is very often neglected. And um, at the moment, uh, we are not talking about this. And also uh, the fitness contents uh, is not so strong in this area. This will hopefully happen in the future. But all these things, and not only for the area, but also for the single product, you have to deal with different functions that are required by the packaging. And this is something I will talk about later. OK, so once again, the basic role of packaging, what does it help for? And does it have also a positive environmental influence? Yes, it has, because it avoids food losses. And food losses are a very strong issue, also often neglected, where um, we have to discriminate between non-industrialized and industrialized countries. And in non-industrialized countries, most of the losses occur to lack of technology and uh, materials, for instance, uh, lack of cooling. And therefore, we have between, and this is difficult to know it for the single product, between 17 and 50 percent gets lost before it reaches the consumer. Here, we lose much less up to the moment when it reaches the consumer, but the a very large portion is wasted by the consumer himself. And this is a fundamental difference, which also has to be reflected in the use of products and packaging. So we have uh, a lot of, let's say, support from the legislation in this context. However, it's written there but it's in most cases not understood by the consumer that packaging is, has a very strong positive function instead of being just waste. So the European Parliament already stresses this, but if you look at the legislation as it is, um, it's written down there, but many people still neglect it, even in the legislation. OK, some figures from the FAO. And I tried to um, um, make a small image of it and to answer the question, what can packaging help to reduce food losses? And we start with the products on the field. We end at the consumed food, and we have different types of losses over the steps. So um, to know what packaging can help, there's no chance to have food packaging. Um, industrial packaging may be different, but the normal food packaging will not help in, uh, with the harvested products. But it helps between the point when the food is packed and the food is consumed. 
And therefore, in non-industrialized countries, we have about, yeah, let's say 10, 12 percent possible effect of packaging on the overall food loss. Whereas in industrialized countries, this figure is much higher. So at best, it can halve food losses, which is a lot, still, but it's not all. It's also important. All right, so some conclusions from this consideration. Um, today we have most products packed, so it's an important element. We use the packaging along the whole value chain in different configurations. We can reduce product losses together with other measures, and uh, it's difficult to say today that packaging amounts so and so many percent of the product losses or avoids so and so many percent of the product losses. This is still difficult because the whole world of different packaged products is so diverse. And uh, but what has to be said is if packaging has to avoid product losses, the main function for this is the protective function, which means to protect packaged goods from different influences from the outside. Okay, so much for this. Um, the basic terminology, just some words about this. So when we use these standards to define what is uh, what are the different uh, elements of packaging, we have the packaging material, which is the material the packaging is made from. We have a container which is made from this material. This is also called a receptacle, a little bit a strange word. Um, we also have other packaging components which are used to finalize the container or receptacle. All together make the packaging, which are the objects used to package. Uh, we have the product, which is to be packed. And if we put them together in the operation of packaging, together with packaging machinery, we have the so-called package. And this is further transferred to retail trade and so on. So especially when we talk about packaging material or when we talk about packaging operators, this is especially important in uh, the legal documents where this is uh, very often not done very properly, especially, for instance, in Germany, where people talk, where the, the, the legislators talk about packaging producers. But what is made, uh, meant there is packaging companies who package food. It's not the producers themselves. So you may be, you may, um, need this information to be proper in the terminology. So what we have to look at, and this is very often happening, for instance, if you look at uh, stores where non-packed foods are sold. Are they all non-packed? No, because we only have we, we have one package, which is the primary package, or also in many cases, the secondary package. It's <coughs> more or less the shells of an onion. <coughs> but we also have the transport package. This is something you as a consumer don't see when you buy some product. So for instance, uh, uh, stores selling unpackaged goods receive their products in a transport package. So you have to think about this as well, not only about the primary package. Some examples of this, we have, let's say, a nice example, wine in a bottle. 
uh, Thomas will like it <laughs> most of all of us. Um, we have uh, the primary package, which is the bottle. We have also a component of the package, which is uh, the stopper. We have the secondary packaging where the bottle is put in, and we have the tertiary packaging where all the packed secondary packagings are stacked on a pallet, for instance. So this is the, let's say, tertiary packaging is one option to call it, can be also called loading unit. And uh, it's not always the case that the tertiary package is also the loading unit. It can be many shells uh, in between. For instance, if you buy uh, confectionery, you have many more shells. <clears throat> And uh, what should also be looked at is, uh, for instance, not only the unit load, which is for truck transport in most cases, or in some cases also rail transport, but uh, you should also look for export packagings to the uh, container, which covers again the unit load. So it's, it may be very complicated. So, some more in additional information. When we call about the packaging material, we talk about the primary material the packaging is being made from. If we talk about the receptacle, it's a, sim a simple uh, consideration. If you can put something in a container and it stays there, this is a container. So, for instance, uh, let's say a paper bag or a liquid beverage carton or a can or even a tray. So there is some terminology from the official legal doc, uh, not legal um, standardization documents. Um, I will not talk too much about this at the moment. Good, some example, practical example. If we have a liquid beverage in Germany, where we have, for instance, fruit juice, where an organization takes care that uh, the, the uh, packaging of the fruit juice is uh, used by all people, to make sure that the, the returnable system works, we have a very stringent specification. So if you buy a fruit juice in a returnable bottle, you have the product itself, and this is right now standardized to the contents of one uh, pellet. We have the glass bottle as a packaging, but that's not all, we have the label, we may have a neck loop, we have a screw cap or another type of closure, in most cases a screw cap for fruit juice, which is from aluminum in this case. And we have a plastic bottle crate, both things are returnable, the glass bottle and the plastic bottle crate, while uh, for instance the screw cap is reworked but it's not reused. We have the returnable pallet and we have the non-returnable strapping tape. Why am I sticking so strongly to this uh, variety? The point is, if you talk about environmental impacts, as you will do later, um, you have to not only to talk about a glass bottle, it's a whole variety of in many cases, returnable and non-returnable elements of the whole packaging system. And this makes things complicated and it makes simple uh, truths uh, less true than they seem to be at the moment. Okay, so it's good to know about the terminology to talk with others to avoid misunderstandings and to be 
on the right way. Good. Then the next point are the packaging functions. I will talk about a little bit. Usually you find the four letters P, C, C, C as the packaging function. This is, can be found in several textbooks. And I would say we need a fifth one, which is the environmental functions and the conservation of the environment in addition to this. So this means that we have to look at this in more detail today because this is being asked for. But what you should avoid to think about is, can we sacrifice those functions on behalf of this? The answer is no, because if we, for instance, sacrifice the protection in, uh, on behalf of conservation, we fail in avoiding food losses. And this is important. I will give you some examples uh, in a minute. So the protection just in one image is to have the product protected from anything what may come to the product from the outside. These may be gases, water vapor, it's also a gas, but Usually one differentiates because water vapor is condensable, whereas oxygen, for instance, for instance, is it, it isn't because you need 180 something minus 80 something degree to have it in the, the liquid phase, whereas water vapor can be liquid in a minute. We have particles to protect the product from. We even have uh, some, let's say, trivial things like insects, um, which is in some areas of packaging a, a very important thing. Microorganisms, that's more obvious. Contaminants, you know about the, the, the options that may happen to wine when you have um, some very odorous contaminants from the outside, which may not be nice to the product. We may have to protect the product against heat, light, and mechanical loads. So all this is a function of the packaging. But there's an additional function which is also regulated. And this is the protection against contaminants from the packaging itself. This is an additional issue. It's not only the outer environment, but it's the packaging itself. This is more important since uh, we have so many different plastics with their different additives. Okay, so we have different origins for product damage. We have the environment, which may just attack the product and to estimate the protection given by the package. It's the sensitivity of the product together with the performance of the package. So if you have a low sensitive product, you may have also a low functional package, whereas with a high function a sensitive product, you have to use a highly functional package. We have the packaging itself, I already talked about, and this is regulated in the EU and it's also regulated in the US and also some other parts of the world are already starting to go on with this regulation. Whereas other countries, uh, there the people don't think about this at all. So I often receive uh, papers in my other function as an editor for a packaging journal. And there's many scientists who do not think about this at all. They develop new packaging materials, but they don't think about the, the question, 
whether these materials themselves may give a negative influence to the packaged goods. Good, so some interim conclusions. We have um, substances to protect the product from. We have energetic effects like light, for instance, or heat. We have also biotic effects like insects or microorganisms. And um, it's a very important part of the packaging knowledge to understand the interaction between the function of the package and the requirements of the packaged goods. So as a result, if we fail in protecting, we increase product losses. And the packaging must be itself safe enough to package. Good. So I just go through the different uh, points of this P e and four C's. We were at the protection level. We are right now at the point of containment. Containment may be trivial in many cases when we talk about packaging, but in fact, it's not always the case. For instance, if we have a metal package, it may be corroded and then the containment is gone. It does not happen very often, but in some cases we have some uh, very tricky cases where this happens. We also may have macroscopic defects in the package, especially when we talk about paper. Paper is, let's say, a large defect, so to say. It consists of fibers, and in between, we have nothing but defects. So water, for instance, if you want, would like to package water in a pure paper package, uh, the result will be obvious. Um, but also powdery ingredients. They are very often packed in cardboard or paper packages, and um, these often fail. Whereas if we talk about uh, plastic packaging, we talk about permeation where the substances may go through the intact <coughs> wall of the package. This is often neglected because you may ask uh, 100 people from the street and uh, I would say 70% of them will, ask, will say that uh, plastic packaging is totally impermeable, which it isn't. So we have these three different ways. We have leakage through defects, we have permeation through intact packagings, and we have corrosion for intact packagings, which are then corroded, and we go then up again to the point of leakage. This is a practical example I took from an own can of uh, tin plate can where I think it was ananas that was inside there, or may, maybe also peers. And this is, a, this is a tin plate can without an inner coating, an inner additional coating. So the coating is tin on steel. And where it's white, the tin is still intact. And uh, where it is gray or even brown, the tin has gone and the packaging has corroded. Uh, it creates funny effects, for instance, bombing the can. And yeah, it, it does not happen very often because most cans today are internally coated with a uh, lacquer layer. But once again, the lacquer layer creates other problems as well. So if we summarize this, you can say fibrous materials lead to leakage, so you must be very careful with them and uh, to replace pa uh, plastics by paper is not an easy task. Um, polymeric material have the problem of permeation and the polymers uh, themselves are very different in permeation properties. So some of them are 
very dense, whereas others are more or less a sponge uh, with respect to substance transport, and metal is attacked by corrosion. Okay. Then we have the communication element. And the communication, especially in Europe, is strongly regulated. You have a lot of so-called interesting word, word, mandatory particulars. This is something everyone has to write on a package. Okay, this is not packaging related, but the quantity, for instance, this is related to the packaging itself. For instance, if you have a, a liquid product, the water may permeate outside, and after a certain time, you have less contents after after a waiting time, for instance. Um, also, the packaging process, how exact does it work? Not easy. The net filling quantity, and the date of the minimum durability date or the so-called use by date. Different, both because min minimum durability means it may live even longer, whereas the use by date tells you don't use it afterwards. It differs from product to product. And you also have the Nutrition declaration, what may happen there? For instance, if you have oxygen permeation and you have a highly vitamin C beverage, for instance, like orange juice, they have an example, then this may change. So to say, this is the example from the orange juice. This one, this uh, mandatory particular, depends on the filling process and also on the water water vapor permeability of the, the container. If you have a plastic one, this may decrease. We have the amount of vitamin C, which may not be constant if you have admission of oxygen. And uh, you have the date of minimum durability, which may depend on the package and many other things in the environment. So just to clarify, and these are the regulatory uh, formulations, <clears throat> we talk about the use by date, which is for goods which are microbiologically sensitive. Uh, and if you use a product after the use by date, may run into severe trouble, especially when you're dealing with meat in a vacuum package or in a can, uh, you may even die. Um, 25 percent of the consumers may, uh, asked in a survey already 12 years ago, they did not understand this term. And um, the minimum durability, in this case, the product may be even still good after this date. Depends on especially also your own uh, preferences. Um, many people think this is identical to this one, which it isn't. So also there, nearly one quarter of the consumers don't understand this. And I think these figures are still rather, uh, yes, conservatively estimated. I think it's many more than those 25%. All right, so once again, the communication. What does this package communicate? It communicates that it contains 37 centiliters. And there's this E sign before, which um, indicates that this is in conformity with the regulation of the EU, which gives limits for the deviations. 
So it must not necessarily be exactly 35, 33 centiliters, but it can be a little bit lower or, on the contrary, a little bit higher. This is necessarily from technical points of view, but this must be regulated because otherwise uh, people are, customers are uh, not really given the amount they buy. Um, interesting thing, this is the newest figure I found because uh, it's more difficult in the meantime to find these figures. Um, a certain amount of packages does not really, is not really in conformity with this regulation. So a consumer is being sold less than he expects. So this is a matter of uh, legal prosecution afterwards, but there's still a lot of uh, suppliers who don't really care. Good, and this is more specific, the amount of possible deviations. So for instance, uh, if you have a small package, um, there may be a deviation up to 9% of its content. This is not a legal issue once it is um, less than in case of 2% of the packages. If it's more, then it becomes a legal issue. Good, so we have to communicate the content in many cases, and we have to fulfill the legal requirements from this. And um, we have also to know about shelf life, filling quantity, and so on. So to fulfill these criteria, it's not only a matter of the packaging process itself, but it's also a matter of the packaging. Because if you have, as again, again said, if you have permeation, you may have less quantity after a certain shelf life. Okay, the next point is convenience. And many people think that convenience is a luxury. For instance, if you have a sliced cheese in a convenience package that can be also reclosed, this is the point here. Um, does this really help? It helps the consumer to have less activity. That's one thing. But the other thing is that it helps also to reduce food losses. <clears throat> and this is given by some examples I selected. For instance, if you um, have packed fruit, you may reduce the food losses by a factor of two up to a factor of 12. Maybe consistent with your, your own experience, if you buy fruit on the market, you know that a lot of them is already getting molded, uh, get molded after the, uh, two days or so. Whereas in these packages, it may live one week. Same is for cheese or for meat. So we have a look a lot of additional activity of the packaging to reduce food losses. And this means that convenience is not only a negative thing. It's necessary also to consume and it reduces the losses. So even if you ask the consumers, do you like convenience packaging? Most will, will say, no, uh, I would like to buy unpacked goods. Will it get up to 80% of the persons answering this? But if you look what people really buy, you will recognize that they buy convenience products. So 
many people think that this is uh, schizophrenic and uh, is negative, but I think don't don't be so strict in this point. Convenience is has a lot of positive functions. Okay, conservation, the final point. When do we talk about the cons conservation effect of packaging? As I several times said, it's to avoid food losses, yes. On the other hand, we create waste and litter. And this is the current problem we have to solve. People say a circular economy infrastructure will help there. Yes, it will. But it's also the action of the consumer that may help there. So, especially for those who are still not convinced, this is an old figure from 1995 where someone cre uh, collected and uh, investigated the <laughs> amount of energy used to prepare food, to prepare packaging, to, and all the other uh, actions in addition to that. And what you can see is that not only the food supply makes a big issue, but also home storage and cooking. So the worst thing where that can happen is to waste a product after cooking because it's being degraded. Therefore, it's not always the best thing to think. To think about saving packaging on the cost of food protection. Okay, I think I can uh, skip this. This is something you can read afterwards, the packaging materials. In most cases, people think that plastics are the predominant material. In fact, it's paper and cardboard and also glass. That's due to the heavy uh, nature of glass. And uh, this is something we will be talking about on the afternoon, um, the targets of the European Union to reduce packaging waste, which over the decades has a, a, a tendency just to grow instead of going to decline. So just this is uh, the performance of the countries. You see that there's some countries who are uh, recycling a lot and not using landfill anymore, the top ones here. Whereas there's many others, uh, Romania, Malta, Croatia, and so on, who are still using landfill by a large extent. And uh, this is something that's being reduced by the uh, legislative actions of the European Union. So in the end, we need a circular economy, but um, we still are not very good in Europe in the performance of doing so. So there's a long way to go. I don't want to go too strong in, into the details of this figure. And also the quota, which are raised over the time, they are quite high in the meantime, but to achieve recycling, recycling quota of plastics or much higher than 50% is still a big task for us. Um, one additional remark, um, the extended producer responsibility. The in the EU and especially in the different member states of the EU, extended producer responsibility has come up. This means that the producer assumes responsibility for his own products. And this is also important for packaging. In Germany, we have this by the so-called systems. Before they were called dual systems. Today, they are just called systems. 
and in France they are called eco-organizations. And these are some um, organizations formed by the industry to take care of the waste and to recycle it. So this is the so-called extended producer responsibility. If you hear the word, just remember this, what I showed here. All right, so conservation. We need closed loop recycling in packaging. We must regard the, envi the positive environmental function, but uh, without recycling, this is nothing. And um, we need to go a long way there. Final conclusions. Um, a little bit over time, sorry for that. Uh, you have to look about the packaging functions, not only for the product packaging, but also for the other parts of the packaging chain. Um, most of it is the consumer package, that's for sure. Not many people talk about uh, industrial packaging. Um, we have to reduce product losses and we have to meet the legal requirements. So this is a very strong argument to use packaging. But what is also important is that the packaging functions are very product specific. So if you don't understand anything about the product, it will be difficult to understand which packaging you need. And we need a very stringent weighing up of the pros and cons of a certain package. But this is something Sandra Dominic will talk about later a little bit. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. OK. No, I, I think this is this is something you can read afterwards. And thank you for your attention. I already more than five minutes over time. Thank you. <laughs>